My name is Ted Tan. I've been working on human rights for the past 17 years. And the issues that I've worked on are like general human rights, civil and political rights, migrant labour rights, basically almost all the major rights that affect us as human beings. I'm based in Singapore. I have some exposure to it during my university days. I studied overseas and I came back to Singapore. At that time, Think Centre was one of the local organising uh, committee members that is helped organise this third ASEAN Civil Society Conference. I would say introduced to this concept of human rights work in the region. Human rights, as you understand, are universal values, right? But I mean, from my experience, is is something at the time uh, is not so clear cut. Actually, you know, it is okay. Something on paper you read, okay, human rights are universal. We are all equal, and you know, uh, there should be no discrimination because of our different statuses like your age, your ethnicity and and uh, the work that you do and how wealthy you are or how poor you are. In Singapore, how, how the government defines you being political is even if you talk about things related to rights, that's political. Back in the earlier days, right, that there was very little room for freedom of thought even. Like you are told what to to do what to think and anything beyond this that does not contribute to the economic uh, development, please stay away or, or leave it to the elites to determine what is the best cause of, uh, of action, right? So, so it was a very interesting uh, uh, reason for naming the group as Think Center because you want to create the space, the platform for people to think freely. And of course, uh, we adopt the human rights values. We, we try to think things along the human rights values and principles. Yeah, but it does not like impose that you must follow this. I think I have been quite consistently working on, on, on things like uh, anti-death penalty, uh, migrant labor rights, and if I could categorize it more broadly, it's just like uh, civic participation. When we talk about the death penalty, uh, it can be a emotive kind of topic, especially when we get asked, so why do you support uh, the taking away of the death penalty? So right now, I, I would say I, I'd rather support taking away the use of death penalty rather than taking away people's life in any way. But that's my uh, approach to it. I have a lot of obligations to fulfill to because I'm in this society, uh, I'm doing all this, but do I, what are my rights, you know? But it's not a natural thing for people to ask sometimes. I think um, being involved at the ASEAN Civil Society Conference and slash the ASEAN People's Forum. It's, it's a very educative process for me personally, right? I am not sure about others, but uh, because you, you, it's a very rare opportunity for, I think for one to be able to be exposed to so many different topics across the region at, uh, in a few days setting. And uh, you get to learn so much about uh, our region. Yes, uh, a, lot of it, a lot of it are challenges, but a lot of it also involves like trying to create opportunities for engagement and sharing uh, of experiences. Uh, yeah, that's what I really appreciate uh, being involved in the regional work. I think like civic space is always a challenge in, in our region, like not just in my own country, I think in, in the earlier days when uh, ASEAN was like institutionalizing itself uh, before the ASEAN Charter came about, there, there were a lot of interests uh, to help support the civil society to try and uh, organize these kind of uh, conferences or forum. Yeah, there are many reasons, right? But I, I think one of the main, main thing is like they, they don't uh, see what is the value of 
ASEAN People's Forum or Civil Society Conference coming together to uh, try and, and lobby or engage the ASEAN leaders. I think one, one, one thing is people will not necessarily raise concerns or complain or, or advocate for certain things if things were working well, right? But uh, most human rights defenders that I know, uh, they raise issues because their their real issues are uh, their real concerns, right? Uh, things that have uh, affected them or affected their communities, and they are trying their best to um, get the attention of the authorities to address those concerns, right? Or or even other. Uh, powerful non-governmental actors to like businesses right to address these concerns so so if you ask me about the uh, mechani mechanisms like the universal periodic review or the upr i think it's a very interesting and important evolution for uh, civil society everywhere it's still less than 20 years of its existence but uh, if you count give or take 20 years Back then, uh, the number of key human rights treaties that were ratified by the countries in our region have, uh, it's not a lot. Only uh, at the time, I think it was about seven or eight human rights treaties that are, I mean, are there for ratification, right? But uh, the record is very uneven, but it was only in after a major human rights conference in 1995 or 1993 or 1994, then in 1995, you, you suddenly found that, oh, there are almost all the uh, Southeast Asian countries or in the ASEAN uh, have, uh, they started to ratify the CEDAW or the CRC because for countries with very few human rights treaty ratification, uh, the people in those countries have very few avenues to raise concerns, right? Especially when it comes to civil and political rights or their economic or social cultural rights. And if your country didn't ratify and, and yeah, there's just no way of participating in, in even your, your review mechanism under those treaty bodies. Of course, the government of the day is free to reject or to accept the recommendations, but I think it will, it's also helpful for civil society actors to use those uh, recommendations that came out to to inform their advocacy or, or, or their basis for next action, you know, or or engagement. I would say engagement. Yeah. So so it's also helpful in a way that it avoids like direct confrontation. My hope is that everybody uh, should be able to see themselves as human rights defenders, not because something bad happened to them or something bad happened to uh, their uh, loved ones or, or their friends or family or the people around them, but more like to really uphold the value of human rights that protects us from the negative effects of things like discrimination, I mean, discrimination has been around us, the human society, for a very long time. And even if you are a homo homogeneous kind of society, where people supposedly are of the same race, you, you still can get discriminated because simply uh, you, you are born into a poor family. H human rights definitely should cover everyone regardless of our uh, status, like race, the, your choice of whether you want to believe in the religion or not to believe in the religion, right? And of course, uh, the, with the more modern development is the uh, sexual orientation and gender, even gender identity. My message for them is probably not to uh, lose hope, like things will, might improve, things might not improve, but human rights has a value to, to help guide us. We should not lose hope and we can still continue to work together to uh, re realize this vision that you know, all, all human rights are for all.